Hello, welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us at today's breakout session, Getting a Publishing Program Started. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director at the Open Textbook Network, soon to be the Open Education Network. As you know, we're a community of higher ed organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open ed. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OTN. Before we begin, a couple of details. Um, as uh, Anita mentioned before we started recording, uh, you are invited to share any of your questions or comments in the chat. You're invited to turn on your cameras. We always like to see you. Um, OTN is on Twitter at open underscore textbooks and the hashtag for the summit is OTN Summit 20. We are recording this session and the video and transcripts will be posted on our YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. And we're, we're committed to providing a friendly, safe and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu summit community norms. And thank you for joining us in creating a safe and constructive space. So I'm now going to welcome and introduce today's presenter, Anita Walls. Anita is Assistant Director for Open Education and Scholarly Communication Librarian and Associate Professor at University Libraries at Virginia Tech. She's a past member of the OTN Steering Committee and a frequent contributor to OTN efforts. Thank you, Anita. She led development of the 2016 OTN Guide, Modifying an Open Textbook, What You Need to Know, in one of the OTN's first work working groups and was a member of the first cohort of the OTN Publishing Cooperative. She founded the Open Education Initiative at Virginia Tech in 2014. The grant and technical support program has supported instructors to revise or create and publicly release peer-reviewed open educational resources in various formats, including book, video, virtual reality, and ancillaries. Disciplines so far include business, engineering, veterinary medicine, mathematics, statistics, natural resources, medicine, and history. That is a lot. Anita is a native of rural Minnesota. She lives in the mountains of Southwestern Virginia with her husband and dog. Her pandemic work from home hobbies include going to church and everything else online, meeting neighbors, gardening, mask wearing, convincing her parents to stay put and renovating a home for her mother-in-law. So without further ado, over to you, Anita. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Um, I'm really honored to be um, invited to give this talk today, and I look forward to, um, to hearing from those of you who are here about your interest in this topic. Um, I've been at this since 2014 and trying to figure out uh, publishing of open educational resources. So I have a lot of, of I've made a lot of, um, I've learned a lot through the things that I've done um, and have um, have focused really on a lot of different, exploring a lot of different methods for OER creation. So um, in this session, I would like to, one, hear from you if you would like to um, tell me more about what you're interested in learning from this session. Uh, I have two stories to tell you, one on creating an open educational resource and another on mapping out uh, OER publishing services. I have some resources for you. I'd like to engage you in, uh, in some um, collaborative discussion around publishing and we'll talk about any questions you may have. Um, so I realize we have a really small audience and I don't know if anyone will will respond to this, but uh, I would like you to please go to uh, menti.com and to this enter this particular number and you'll see a few different questions come up. Um, so using menti.com and the code 268424 um, please answer the question, are you planning to develop an OER publishing program? And the responses are definitely yes. It's likely, I'm not sure, probably not, or I already started. Um, so for those of you who are participating, <laughs> um, I'll give you just a second to respond if you wish. Okay, not sure. Fair enough. Okay. 
um, but you're here, so you're interested in learning. So, uh, and uh, we'll go to the next uh, next question, um, which is, uh, what do you especially want to learn today about OER publishing? And it's fine to say more than one thing if um, there are multiple things that you're interested in learning about. And I don't know is okay also. Okay, that's fine. Don't know what I want to know truthfully. That's totally fine. Um, that's okay. Um, so I want to tell you a couple stories. Um, in 2015, I met a professor um, named um, Stephen Skripak. He's a professor of practice in the Pampin College of, of Business at Virginia Tech. He had noticed in his large introductory business class that students were not reading the assigned text and he was frustrated that the new edition of the book was priced above $200. So he began to explore some other options and was referred to me and said, well, you know, can you help me? What can I, what, what can, what can we do? Can we do anything? What are my options? As we worked together, we identified an existing open textbook with a Creative Commons non-commercial share alike license on it and we decided because the book was four years old that it needed to be updated the data needed to be updated pop culture references um, the graphics needed to be updated there were some um, mismatches with learning objectives uh, and there were some mismatches in the perspective of the book um, that that he specifically didn't like so I reviewed the text tables, the charts, the images to identify copyright issues. I researched the um, sources of data, arranged the graphic design um, to, to be completed. Um, and we, um, we encountered a lot of challenges along the way. Um, so the book was originally um, authored by a publisher that um, retracted their, they didn't want their name and the author's name on it anymore. So we needed to figure out how do we attribute this book um, when we can't list the original author. Um, so I asked a colleague in, uh, in the area of open education, how do I deal with this? Um, in fact, I asked colleagues a lot of questions about how to deal with the questions that were coming up in this process. So some of the challenges that we, uh, other challenges we encountered um, were related to, um, to things that were obviously cosmetic in this case. Um, but one thing we did really well was to identify what we wanted to do from the beginning. What are our goals? What are the, the, the um, requirements that we have for the end product. And we came up with a list of essentially six things. Um, we wanted the book to have no cost. Uh, and we were actually prohibited from adding a cost, adding a, a price to it, um, to the electronic version. We wanted it to be a really good fit for the class and to be engaging for students. Um, it was important that it be accessible. It's also important that it be easily editable by others and that if students wanted to, they could get a print on demand version. We did not make any money. We do not make any money off of these, um, but we wanted to make it possible for students to have um, print if they needed it. Um, so getting here was very difficult. We started with a PDF file. Uh, which is difficult to edit. We attempted to export files from InDesign into Microsoft Word. Uh, we really didn't know very much about the technical environment that we we're working in um, and, and had really no money <laughs> and not a lot of help. Um, so I tell you this because uh, this was a, it was a difficult process. There were things that we did that were um, a lot of work anyway, 
Um, but there were a lot of um, there are a lot of efforts that we made um, <clears throat> that I think did add a lot to the quality of the book. For example, we had students review the book, read it, tell us where they thought they they were distracted, uh, what kinds of figures and examples seemed out of date, um, if they thought the text was too wordy in places. We did a <clears throat> full copyright review of the entire book and really emphasized a, um, a really nimble adaptive approach. Well, as, as you can imagine, um, this was very, it was very difficult. Um, this is, this was my first project. Uh, it was quite challenging to, um, to actually uh, complete this project. Um, however, we did. Uh, and we worked through the issues. Uh, and the first edition, as of um, two years after its launch, this is actually 18 months after its launch, it surpassed 100,000 downloads. We since have revised the book into a second edition. We're at around 500,000 downloads and we're working on a third edition um, this summer. Since then, and since getting more help and talking through all of the issues that, that I encountered in the, the first book project. Uh, I worked with a number of other, um, other people who wanted to create a lot of different kinds of OER. Uh, some of these have been books, for example, sec the second edition of Fundamentals of Business, which you see down here, which is in press books. Um, a book series that was created in LaTeX, which is a mathematical typesetting language a video uh, series on veterinary medicine, virtual reality animals, dog, horse, and a forthcoming cow, and then a, a primary source um, audio reader with transcripts, questions, lesson plans um, that is uh, uses original um, uh, source material from um, Virginia oral history. Uh, all of these projects came out of the experience with the first version of Fundamentals of Business and the challenges that I encountered there. And they've informed um, the approach that I take. Um, they've also encouraged me to keep going, which is really exciting. So in July, we'll publish our first OTM publishing co-op title. Um, and uh, there are quite a few books that are also in the works. So. What happened uh, in 2017, 2016, 2017, that resulted in this, um, these developments? Um, one, I was able to get more support. Uh, I was able to talk through all the problems that I encountered in a very transparent way uh, with some colleagues who were new and who knew more about publishing than I did. Um, and so, two, um, we also mapped out our publication process. So this is really story number two. My colleague and I sat down with a pile of sticky notes and a piece of a uh, large piece of tag board and wrote down all of the different parts of the projects that we were working on from start to finish. Uh, and we came up in, in, in 2017 with this uh, from start from left to right, start to finish. Um, where, where do we start with projects? And then what happens at the end? What are all the steps in between? Um, we have still had a lot of questions at this point. Um, and what I can tell you is that we're still working on this. Uh, in fact, as of about two weeks ago, we met to talk about our OER workflow and how that integrates with Virginia Tech Publishing. Um, so this part of the project is very much under construction. Individual books have had lots of personal attention. Um, and as we look to be a bit more systematic, uh, we're still growing and still uh, developing the, the, um, the processes and workflows that we're hoping to use. Um, so I tell you these two stories because I think the tendency for a lot of people is to jump right in and to say, oh, people want to write, which is what people were asking me for. They said, oh, well, I don't want to adopt. I want to write something new. <laughs> and, um, 
and it can work, um, but knowing are you ready? Are they ready? Do you have capacity um, to support them? What do they, what kinds of things do they need to, um, to be able to move forward? What do you need to be able to support them? Um, this is not a project for one person. Um, it requires a lot of external support. Uh, and I, I don't say that to say, well, you can't do this if you're in a small institution. I think you still could do it, but knowing which parts of it um, you can um, hand off to someone else or you can pay for is very valuable. So what are some tools in assessing readiness and capacity for this kind of work? Uh, for individual projects, I want to <clears throat> show you some different things. So this is called OER Canvas. Uh, this was originally developed in German and translated into English and probably um, several other languages. Um, but OER Project is a map um, which asks the person proposing the project, what are you trying to make? What, what's the format? Who is, who is it for? What are the goals involved in this? What should people who use this know or be able to demonstrate or to do? Um, will it be primarily used for teachers? Is it for students? Is it for the general public? Uh, how will this resource be licensed? Um, and then in what format will this be? What technical format? Is this in PDF? Is it HTML? Is it something in Pressbooks? Is it an EPUB? Um, what is this, this thing? And then um, how will you organize your project plan? What tools are you going to use to do that? Um, what partners will you have? Will you have buy-in if a faculty member comes to you and says, I want to do this, will, you, will they have buy-in from their department? Do they need peer reviewers? Do they need um, what, what kinds of partners will they need to ensure quality? Uh, how much time is this going to take um, in effort? And who is doing what? Uh, you can also ask, well, what kind of existing materials are, are you building on? Um, if you have other openly licensed content, that can save you a lot of time in getting this project started. Um, incentives for collaboration are important. Um, what kind of rewards does the author need or expect or want? Um, are they getting grant money? Um, are they getting uh, um, credit in, in the work? Uh, are other contributors getting credit in the work? How will you distribute this? And then how will you archive it? How you make sure that it doesn't go away after two years or, or um, how, how will you make sure that it is in a stable format? Okay, so that's one tool. This tool is primarily for, for um, authors and collaborators. Uh, there are two different OER production uh, workflows that I like to look at also. Um, these, this comes out of the University of Hawaii, and it's a five-stage process. So it has the priming phase, pre-production phase, design, development, and publishing phases. In each of these phases, the person proposing the project is asked to please um, respond to some questions. Is what you're making <laughs> unique? Have you already explored? The open educational resources in your subject area? Uh, have you been trained in OER and copyright? Are you confident to begin working on these kinds of projects? So this is, is asking the question of the author or author teams. Uh, the, in the pre-production phase, defining what your desired outcome is and whether or not you have enough support. In the design phase, creating the outline understanding uh, what kind of um, digital media, media you want to include. Uh, in the development phase, actually writing the content, uh, getting peer review, um, 
importing into your platform for publishing and then publishing the work. Um, there's a production workflow that is adapted from this from University of Iowa that uh, you can also look at. Another guide that is very helpful for individual projects is the Rebus Guide to Publishing Open Textbooks. And this is, is um, a pretty lengthy guide that is a wonderful introduction for authors to look at uh, to understand what goes into creating a, a high quality project. Um, as you can see, it focuses on team building, uh, defining your project, content creation, quality, um, quality measures, so getting feedback and review, um, planning for marketing, for release, and then um, after a book is released, uh, the types of things that are, are tasks that you may do, including version history. Uh, the beauty of open textbooks and open educational resources is that they can be adapted. So if you're adapting and re-releasing, it's helpful to tell people what is different about your work versus um, the work that someone else did. Um, and we also have the OTN OER Publishing Toolkit. Um, Karen, do you want to say anything about the Publishing Toolkit? Sure. So much like Anita described in her second story of mapping the publishing process, we did the same thing similarly at a library publishing forum last year with a group of both uh, faculty authors and librarians and others who project manage open textbook projects. And so we identified uh, typical phases, everything from the program planning phase to the call for proposals, while authors are writing and up until publishing and sharing. And then we either created or identified existing templates and forms or resources that you can use in each phase. So if you want sort of a chronological map of what things do I need, um, that is what the toolkit is aiming to do. It's also um, something we use as a touchstone in Pub 101 which is an orientation to publishing for the OTN community. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so the toolkit includes very focused resources uh, that are relevant to um, publishing open textbooks. Um, I would highly recommend if you're considering uh, developing a publishing program or if you're working on, on um, potentially publishing open textbooks or OER, that you take a read through of the different um, tools available in, in this guide. Um, for example, here's the capacity scan workshop, or sorry, worksheet. Uh, this worksheet helps you identify maybe where some of your strengths are, where some of your weaknesses are with regard to the potential for publishing. Um, this um, covers your abilities, abilities of your partners, um, the technology that you have available to you or not, um, the financial resources that you have available to you, how much um, flexibility you have in taking care of yourself and uh, how much support you have within your institution or your um, your project do you have that kind of support for for the work that um, that you may be taking on um, Karen is also putting in the pub 101 um, curriculum link in the chat um, thank you that's really helpful um, so when we're talking about workflows for books. Those could be related to particular books that are being published. They can also be related to um, large numbers of, of resources that are being published and having more of a, a streamlined view of a publishing service. The Library Publishing Coalition has a, um, has a a document uh, within their curriculum that is available for anyone to read 
on content strategy. Um, they named two different approaches, having a service-oriented approach. People come to you, you help them, off they go. Um, an editorial-driven approach is a second approach where you identify um, these are the areas of focus for our project. Uh, we will say no to things that are uh, outside of our scope. Um, perhaps you focus on uh, a, sub, uh, a subject area that is of strength for your institution. Um, perhaps you're trying to develop something that, um, or to develop a list that, or a publication list that's more familiar um, for, um, to, to a, a sort of press opportunity. Um, but these documents are very helpful in thinking through what are all of the the components, uh, what, are, what are some examples of um, how different presses have done this and how have they put their work into action. Uh, it also includes a readiness survey, which I love. This is one of the most powerful parts of this work uh, is to say, okay, similar to the OTN um, um, survey, Rate your current level of knowledge or skill in the following areas. And this is just to get a really good grasp of where you are, what you might need to know, what you might need to do, uh, what kind of expertise you might need to bring on board, or if there's something that you say, well, that's not really important to us. Um, we're going to, to um, let that go. Um, there are four parts of this self-evaluation rubric um, covering strategy, covering actual production activities, uh, and um, most of them relate to either long form, which would be books or journals. And um, you can pick and choose and see what is useful for, for your particular purpose. Um, so I would like to, um, if, if you're willing, to offer an invitation to collaborate and uh, some of the things that I've been, um, been asking questions of um, or that are helpful to talk about when, when people are considering creating a new um, publishing program. It, are the types of um, capacities that you already have. Um, so looking at my situation with our first book, I had a repository. I had um, some of the software I needed. I had help with graphic design. I had some help with copy editing. Um, what are those things that, um, that you, you have access to? Maybe you have an institutional repository. Maybe there is a publishing arm of, maybe you have a press on campus. We do not, um, but maybe, maybe you do at your institution. Um, second question, um, what do you feel like you need? What kind of information or other things would help you to move forward? Um, I always ask, uh, what might you share that would help other people? Um, what you have, even if you assume it's not very valuable, is knowledge that other people could, could learn from. Um, looking at critical factors, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I put the bit.ly link in the chat and then I went to it and it doesn't look like it's the Google Doc that you're also in. Would you mind dropping that link in here? Yes. We're, we're in something called collaborating and curating your way to the OER for the classroom, which also looks helpful. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. <laughs> um, okay, so I will fix that when um, <laughs> um, once I get offline. Um, okay, Thank so you. what kinds of things would you um, would you share that could help other people? And then um, what are the critical factors that keep you from starting or delay a start for an OER publishing program? Do you not have the kind of support you need? Um, do you feel uh, less than confident in starting this kind of work? Um, identifying what those things are can be really valuable. Um, a couple other questions. 
what changes do you want to see in how OER publishing is, is, um, is currently practiced? Uh, so for example, um, we're moving, broadening the scope of what the Open Textbook Network is. Um, this has been a reality for a while, but just not in name. So perhaps looking at other kinds of resources, uh, open educational resources beyond textbooks. Um, perhaps seeing changes in how, uh, how books function uh, or how learning resources function or how student engagement in creation of learning resources function. Those are all um, good examples. And then I've created a list of a number of of additional resources for getting started in OER publishing. And I'm just asking folks to add any additional resources to the list below that might help them uh, or that they found that have been helpful for them. This is not a, a, an exhaustive list, um, but a list of selection, selected resources. Um, included in this list are some self-paced learning opportunities, uh, moderated learning opportunities, some of which are um, for fee. Uh, there are a number of documents, um, books, blogs, other documents on methods for um, creating open educational resources. Of course, there are many technical platforms where things can live. And uh, I think there's probably time for a, a new guide in this area. Uh, as well as several organizations that are active in this space. So I would invite you as you're considering um, your, your different um, options um, to reflect on these questions and to contribute where, where you wish. Um, so that is um, all that I have to offer today. I'm happy to talk more about specific questions. Um, but thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to seeing uh, what will come of your, your um, work out of your institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita, for sharing all that you've learned in a few but intense years working in OER publishing. <laughs> um, to clarify, I think I was having a copy-paste issue. Your link looks fine. So okay. sorry about okay. that. That's okay. Um, I would now like to invite our participants to ask us anything. Um, if you want to hear more stories from Anita about projects she's worked on, um, other tools she might recommend, or even share with us, you know, what you're thinking, what you might be excited about, or what you're feeling a lot of trepidation about, we can just um, have a casual conversation. If you would feel more open to having that conversation, if we stop recording, I am happy to stop recording. Uh, we captured Anita's presentation, but we can just have an informal conversation amongst ourselves too, to kind of uh, keep it from living forever. So why don't I just go ahead and do that? I'm going to stop recording. Let's do that. Thank you.